fellow went into a barber shop to have his hair and his beard cut, as always, and he started to have a good conversation with the barber who was taking care of him, and they talked about many things, and suddenly the subject shifted to a discussion about God. And the barber said, frankly, I don't believe that God exists, as you say. And his client said, well, why do you say that? To which the barber replied, well, it's easy. All you have to do is go out on the street to realize God doesn't exist. Tell me, the barber says, if God existed, why would there be so many people who are sick? Why would there be so many children, orphaned, abandoned? If God existed, why would there be so much suffering and pain? The barber said, I just can't imagine a God who commits these things. The client stopped to think for a moment, but so asked to pre prevent an argument, decided not to respond. The barber finished up his job. And the client left the shop, and just as he was stepping out on the sidewalk, he saw a man on the street with long, scraggly hair and a scruffy-looking beard. It looked like it had been quite a while since he had had any TLC. He looked so untidy. The client whirled around and went back in the barber shop, and he said to the barber, he said, you know what? Barbers don't exist. <laughs> and the barber said, what do you mean they don't exist? Here I am. No, 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 the client explained. They don't exist because if they did, there would be no people with long hair and scraggly beards like that fellow who's walking down the street. The barber said, well, barbers do exist. But what happens is that people don't come to me. Exactly, said the client. That's the point. God does exist, but... What happens is that people don't go to God. They don't look to God. And that's why there's so much turmoil in the world and in our lives. To be honest, some of us don't come at all. Or if we come to God or turn to God or call out to God, it's sort of only as a last resort. I mean, we've tried everything else in our own strength and our own might, everything that ought to work, and if it doesn't, then we think about God. But we come sometimes without any real expectation. I had a wonderful message last week from Reverend Tony Freeman, if you were here. He spoke about the mighty God who, who brings transformation to our lives. People who look to God and really expect something to happen. We joke around here sometimes when we talk about our, um, our strategic plan. I wanted us to have a little slogan. Um, it didn't go over too well with the strategic planning team. I wanted us to say our business is spiritual makeovers. Because that really is what we're about. And as we find ourselves in the third week of Advent, We've looked at various snapshots of the one to come. Wonder of the Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Maker or Father, Eternal One, a timeless name. And I think there's probably no better time than Advent to speak about and to think about a topic of tremendous importance. And that's how do we make sense of our lives? What is it that gives our life meaning? What brings us fullness? or in some cases, the lack thereof. There's no question we all want our lives to count. When our heart beats, that final time when we step over into eternity, what do we want said about our lives? What difference did it make that we were on this planet? What impact, eternal impact, will each of our lives have? When we think theologically about the everlasting God, some synonyms come to Eternal, immutable, unchanging, perpetual, from ancient times, of endless duration, permanent. Get the idea? I doubt it. Because it almost defies 
our ability to comprehend. Someone who existed from all time. But I think the key to living victoriously is understanding something about this timeless God. And that that is God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. We're not just randomly placed or haphazardly bopping around this planet. No more than, let's just say, Webster's Dictionary was the result of an explosion in a print shop. <laughs> when we really understand that God has a purpose in our lives, and when we discern it and lean into it, that makes us unstoppable. No matter what happens to us or around us, and as we begin to embrace God's purpose and plan for our lives, it enables us to rise above setbacks that come our way in circumstances. It helps us be able to navigate turbulent times and to move forward, no matter which way the tide is flowing. And when we get, we really get, and the truth sinks down into our spirits, that the creator of the universe, the eternal, everlasting God, has had one purpose from the beginning of time, just one, and that's an intimate, personal connection with each one of you. And when you begin to think about all that God has done and continues to do to secure your redemption, your restoration, wow, maybe you'll begin to understand just how important you are in the whole scheme of things. Let's just review quickly a few thousand years of history, beginning with creation. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God. Interesting there, Elohim is plural the word, the name for God there. I like not only in the beginning, but in the middle and in the end, God. We heard Joe read from John's Gospel about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And by the way, in my translation, Word has a capital W. But we go back to Genesis and scoot on down to about verse 26. Then God said, let us Again, make a human in our image according to our likeness. And so God creates this human being in the spiritual image of God with an eternal, everlasting quality. By Genesis 2.17, God is putting those human beings in charge, and telling them to be fruitful and multiply, and telling them also that they can trust God as their maker and provider, and sets up some boundaries in the garden, and says, everything that's here is yours to enjoy, have at it, except for this one tree over here, the knowledge of good and evil, leave it alone. Now, you know how hard it is when you have everything but one thing? That's the one thing you want to have, isn't it? It's like, you know, you're walking down sidewalks, the same sidewalk by the same park, day after day after day. Wouldn't even occur to you to touch the bench. But one day you see a wet paint sign on it, don't touch, <laughs> and you just want to go over because it told you not to. Well, there, chapter 3 of Genesis starts, now the serpent, of course. However you understand that temptation came in, eat, don't eat, eat, don't eat, they ate. And when they did, that oneness, that connection, that communion with God was severed, was broken down, and separation, we call it sin, came in. And in that same moment, God mobilized all creation, all time, set about to redeem, to restore that connection, that relationship with human beings. At first, it was through the people of Israel, Abraham and Sarah, the covenant, the Old Testament law, and through sacrifices and rituals, God arranged ways for that separation for our sins to be atoned for. But no matter how hard we tried 
Humans were never quite able to keep the law. And so the scripture says, in the fullness of time, God came to us in the person of Jesus Christ, that baby born in Bethlehem, who Peter describes in Acts 10, 38, went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed, for God was with him. God in flesh, doing ministry on the earth, showing us what God is like lived, crucified, died, and on the third day was raised again and came to assure his followers of the coming of the Holy Spirit who gathered the church then and who gathers the church now. And so here we are, called together with one goal and one purpose, to invite people back into relationship with God. From the very beginning of time, the everlasting maker has wanted companionship with human beings. In our generation, I think one community in particular has been estranged, has been cut off by the religious authorities in our day. But let me assure you this morning that you, being you, being precisely who you are, and where you find yourself and be in this place this morning is not a random accident. It's not an uncanny coincidence, but rather part of a perfect plan that's been unfolding from the moment of creation and being defined more clearly from the moment you were born, authored from start to finish by the everlasting God, perfectly woven together with the fabric of other lives that you've intersected at different moments, different times, and somehow gathered here in this location at this point in history for purposes, some of which we understand and some of which are beyond our ability to comprehend. God's eternal purpose. I love what Isaiah says. Oh Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt you and give praise to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans, for me long ago with perfect faithfulness. And then the psalmist in Psalm 90 says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you did give birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And then, of course, what message on God's plan and purpose would be complete without me sharing my life first? Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, I alone know the plans I have for each one of you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to bring about the future that you hope for. Now that's good, but Jeremiah goes on to verse 12. Then you will call upon me and pray to me. You will come to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Isn't it time we stop resisting God's plan? Some of us made excuses long enough. Some of us tried to fill the empty places in our life with just about everything we can think of. And guess what? we end up just as empty. Now, I know some of you flirt with the idea of letting God have the reins of your life. And I watch you, and when it starts to get a little uncomfortable, you start getting a little afraid of what it might cost or take. You think about the loss rather than the gain, and then you hold on all the harder. And then if I were real honest with myself, I'd say there are some folks who haven't really given much energy or thought to God's plan in their life at all. A nice idea, but a personal relationship. I mean, an intimate, one-on-one -on -one quality time with the everlasting God. Some of you haven't seen much need for the connection, or maybe you saw the need, but weren't really putting enough value on it to make it a priority. Alternatively, some of you 
maybe truly longed for it. But somebody did a you're not worthy job on you. And crawling out from under that and seizing that relationship just seemed too far off. Well, Advent is about God coming near. And this morning, the creator of the universe is calling your name. Each one of you. No exclusions, no exceptions. Tugging at your heart is the everlasting God who knows you better than you know yourself and saying to you, it's time to come home. Lay down your defenses. Let me pierce through that tough, I don't need anybody shell. Then you will come to me and pray to me. And I will listen to you, says your God. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. God is inviting the person in your chair and saying, let me work out my timeless purposes in you. Please, isn't it time we said yes? Amen. Please rise as you're able.